am about to read a passage of scripture that doesn't sound like a really thanksgiving -y type scripture. It's really a passage that is a list of names from the book of Romans. You don't know these people. You probably don't know these names. You've maybe never even read this passage before. And many of these names, true confessions, are hard to pronounce. Um, in fact, I was thinking as I looked over this list of names, I distinctly remember when I was a kid, I decided I was going to read the Bible from uh, front to back. That seemed what good Christians did. And I opened up my Bible and I started reading Genesis 1 in the beginning. And I never made it out of chapter 4 because there's all that genealogy you know, so-and-so begot, so-and-so begot. Oh, it's never ending. I never made it out of chapter 5. But when it comes to pronouncing names, these are tricky. In fact, I actually have still yet to recover from a time when I heard um, a very smart friend of mine, a very intelligent friend of mine who was in seminary and also a exercise enthusiast, one time stand up in church and read out loud that Jesus was taken to Pontius Pilate. <laughs> I about fell out of my seat that day. And so I know that I am probably going to say some of these names wrong this morning, but as Zach reminded me this week with a Kentucky accent, we all get a pass in here today. So I hope you'll read along with me with these names from Romans chapter 16, 16 verses of names, and, but I ask you to do me a favor and listen to what Paul is saying beyond these names as you hear this text. He says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church at Syncrie, so that you may welcome her in the Lord as it is fitting for the saints and help her in whatever she may require from you, for she has been a benefactor of many and of myself as well. Greet Prisca and Aquila, who work with me in Christ Jesus and who risk their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Epinetus, who was the first convert in Asia for Christ. Greet Mary, who has worked very hard among you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my relatives who were in prison with me. They are prominent among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Greet Ampelatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our co-worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachys. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to my family of Astrobolus. Greet my relative, Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord, Tryphenia and Tryphosa. Greet the beloved Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord. And greet his mother, a mother to me also. Greet Asyncritus, Logan, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermas, and the brothers and sisters who were with them. Greet Philogus, Julius, Nurus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. So Paul is writing a letter to the church in Rome. Romans happens to be one of the longest letters that Paul wrote, and it happens to be one of his last ones. At this point, Paul is well into his missionary journeys. He has seen some things. He's got the scars to prove it. He's been imprisoned. He's seen good days and hard days. He has lived a life on the road. In fact, he writes in Romans that he soon will be packing his bags and headed to Spain, and he hopes to be able to swing by the church in Rome along the way. Now, sometimes when Paul writes a letter to the church, he is addressing a specific issue that's happening in the church. But Romans, it's not so much, although he definitely speaks 
to the present day issues that the church was facing in their lifetimes. Paul says, let love be genuine. Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. In Romans, he tells them to care for those who are weak and hurting, rejoice in hope, persevere in prayer. He tells others not to be judgy. He tries to address one of the big challenges of their time, which was how to be the church with Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. It's hard for you and I to even comprehend the level of challenge this was for them, but this was huge in the early church. There were former Jews that were, had become followers of Jesus, who was, if you missed the memo, also Jewish. <laughs> And they, they wanted to keep their traditional practices, their ways of eating, their Jewish celebrations. And then there were pagan Christians who became followers of Jesus who really didn't see the need to take on a lot of the Jewish traditions to follow Jesus. And so there was always this tension in the early church of Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. And Paul in Romans is trying to speak to that. In fact, he points out throughout his letter that much of his ministry, being a Jewish Christian himself, has been to the Gentile church. He has ministered to pagans in the name of Christ. And he writes in chapter 14, Let us then pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for you to make others fall by what you eat. In other words, they were having real challenges. Uh, for example, let's say a pagan Christian wanted to bring ham to the church Thanksgiving dinner. It was causing controversy. And I make light of that, but it really was a huge challenge to the early church. How these two groups, who used to never have anything to do with each other, are now united as followers of Christ. And then after all this, he gets towards the end of his letter in chapter 16 with this list of names. Do you remember the names? I doubt it. I don't expect any of you to have this passage memorized. I have never had anyone tell me, you know, my favorite passage of scripture is Romans 16. And there is this lectionary, which is a suggested uh, circle of readings throughout three years of cycle for the church. And this, Romans 16, didn't even make the list. It's not on the suggested readings from the lectionary. Why bother with this passage? It's just a list of names. Well, there is a husband and wife listed, Aquila and Prisca, who risked their necks with Paul, he says. Say hello to the whole church that is meeting right now in their house, he says. There's Phoebe, named first in this list of names, a deacon. Doesn't that frost some people's cookies to read that part? <laughs> Phoebe, the church of Syncrie, greet her as one of the saints. Phoebe probably carried that very letter to the church in Rome for Paul. He mentions Nerus and his sister. He lists Epinatus. That one's hard for me to say. The very first convert in Asia. As a minister, I gotta say, you know, you don't forget the first baptism you do. The first baptism I did in Lexington, Kentucky, was a college student at Transylvania. She now works at St. Jude's Hospital. He mentions Tryphania and Tryphosa. You know, one minister I read said that he surmises that Tryphania and Tryphosa must have been twins with their cute little sounding names together. There's Mary. She was a hard worker, Paul says. Greet Andronicus and Junia. Now there's some really, if you want to fall down a real big Bible scholarly rabbit hole, Google the history on the name Junia and later text of the book of Roman. He says, Andronicus and Junia are Paul's relatives who spent time with him in prison and actually were believers in Christ before he even was. Greet Rufus and greet his mother. She's been a mother to me too. 
is this list worth noticing? We don't know these people. For the most part, this is it for them. This is their one big moment to shine in history. They are among a list of names that Paul lists. Astrobolus, Herodian, Perses, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermas, Julius, Olympus. Who are these people? We don't know. What did they do for the church? We don't know. Do you? Now you can look and you will notice. Scholars will tell you that some of them are Jewish Christians, some are Gentile Christians. Some of them must have been rich. Some of them were probably poor. Nine, maybe ten, depending on which scholar you read, says they are women of the 28 names that Paul mentions here. There are people like Paul's family, maybe a cousin or an aunt, Rufus's mother, Mary, who never gave up, Aquila, who was willing to die for his faith with Paul, Urbanus, who worked right beside Paul, a co-worker in Christ, he calls him. What did they do? How'd they serve the church? We don't know. We don't know. We just know that they are remembered. This is Paul's list. He couldn't forget these people. These are the people that had gotten Paul through some really hard times, people who probably helped him financially through his missionary journeys, people who risked their necks for him, loved him and cared for him like one of their own. They are people who cheered him on, encouraged him, prayed for him, shared their bread with him, they showed up to help at the church dinner, and most importantly, these are the people who showed Paul what a life of faith looks like. They showed him how to live and even how to die. 28 names. This is Paul's list. He remembered them. What about you? I'm wondering today what your list would look like. Who's on your list? When you think of the church and all its beautiful messiness, when you think of your own journey of faith, who do you remember? Who do you recall? Who has shown you what it means to follow Jesus? Me? I tell you about Eddie who believed that the church could take on another financial challenge when this minister sure wasn't sure, and he was totally and completely right. I tell you about David, who lost his sight and much of his hearing with age, and he told me after a recent diagnosis that every time he has to let go of something because of his health or his age, he asked God to please show him how he can still serve, how he can still be of use to somebody. And he said, Kara, God always answers that prayer if we just have the courage to pray it. You know, he was still bagging food at the food pantry just a few weeks before he died. I would tell you about casseroles dropped on porches and friends that showed up at hospital bedsides. I'd tell you about Leah who gave me more grace when I didn't deserve it. I'd tell you about Jan who has shown me that God's goodness and love still shines through even when the news isn't good. Who is on your list? You know it's Thanksgiving. And Thanksgiving is not a Christian holiday. It's not. But the sentiment sure fits. We Christians should be really good at Thanksgiving, right? In another one of Paul's letters, his very first letter to the Church of Thessalonians, he says, give thanks in all circumstances. And I've always thought that maybe Paul shouldn't have said all circumstances. I mean, really everything? everything give thanks for it all he's setting the bar so high but then the truth is the more i think about it 
I have never, ever in my life been in a hole so deep and dark that I still couldn't find a little light of Christ's mercy and love at work in my own life. And for that, I am grateful for. Give thanks in all circumstances, he says. I don't know what your Thanksgiving plans look like. This might be the first meal of what is about to be a week Thanksgiving marathon. And seven days from now, you don't want to see another turkey for a long time. Or you might have a quiet meal with just you and the Macy's Day Thanksgiving Day Parade on TV. Whatever table you go to this week, I just ask you to take a little time, if even for just a moment, and to ask yourself, who's on my list? Follow Paul's lead here. Look back for just a bit and remember, if you're lucky, some of those people might even be sitting around the table with you this week. And I don't expect you to remember Paul's list, but I do hope you'll take a moment to remember yours. May your cup runneth over. Amen.